Thank you. I sincerely thank the committee for inviting me and for you guys to stay here to the very end. It's a really honored, a real honor to be closing the session. So it's a very diverse session. We have talks from different fields. So it's a cognitive, very cognitive topic I'm presenting. But in line with the theme of the conference, I will be presenting evidence or examples of how my cognitive studies have been helped by neuroinformatic analysis of brain data. So object, what do I mean by object concepts? I take it uh, from a, a very simple definition. So suppose we see a very simple stimuli. There are many things we know about this that's not contained in the external stimuli, like what the thing looks from the back, what sounds it produces, where it can be found, or something very abstract of the function to us as a human. And of course, the word associated with it. So all these knowledge are represented in the brain. Where and how do we do it? And the dominant view of the recent two decades with help of neuroimaging is really governed by the philosophical idea of luck that is, we represent knowledge from experience. So it's a very reductionist kind of view that we have all these rich knowledge, but it's really reduced to the sensory motor experience we have with it. Like for the example I just gave, what it looks like is represented in the high level visual cortex, what sound it produces is represented in the auditory cortex, and how it moves in the motion MT area. And um, depending on theory, maybe we need a binding site in the ATL or in other cortical areas to bind these multimodal experience-based representations. And this is a very nice framework, and mainly was getting the evidence, the supporting evidence from the early fMRI studies, like uh, this is a pioneer study, so suppose the subject listen to a word or look at a picture. For the same item, when it's retrieving what color it looks it has, it activates visual areas. And the, if you ask what kind of action it produces, it activates frontal areas. And the, also, um, many lines of evidence, like if you compare food pictures to control stimuli, you activate more strongly the insular uh, the taste region. And the activation is actually modulated by how hungry you are, or the blood sugar. So this is very nice framework, and it has been a framework dominating our interpretation of the, all the semantic activation areas. But are we happy with it? I'm going to present two main questions we have been thinking about in our lab of how satisfying this framework is to explain our semantic representation. And the first one is, what is actually represented at these so-called sensory sites? And I'll be using shape, visual shape, object shape knowledge in the visual ventral pathway as an example to see is this a simple memory chase of the visual experience we have with the object. And the other is example is I'm going to give is really data driven from how these widely distributed regions are connected. The connectivity pattern is driving the understanding of uh, our, uh, how we represent semantic knowledge. So the first part is zoom in into the visual ventral pathway, supposedly to, pre to be representing the, our knowledge about the shape of the object. So if we go into the high-level visual cortex, the signature is we go from very simple visual features, but somehow get to the, these signature clusters to be more responsive to faces, scenes, like objects or animals. Where do these clusters come by? In most of the explanation comes from the visual domain. It's how these different things look different. Like we look at faces with phobia, we look at scenes with per per peripheral vision. Uh, animals have more curved features, but artifacts has more like straight lines. But there's a recent wave of findings of finding very similar object category selectivity in congenitally blind subjects. And for instance, people have seen um, seen activation in PPA with blind subjects. People have found visual word form area when blind people read Braille or they receive their letter sound by shape, uh, letter shape by sound input. And also some of my work from my own lab looking 
finding that actually blind people also activate PPA when they hear names of big objects or tools. Just a simple example, these are usually how the experiments are done. Like, uh, uh, this is the parahippocampal place region that's highly activated by large objects or things in comparison to other objects. And the surprisingly, we also find it when the blind, congenitally blind who has never seen this, hear the names of these objects. So this wave raises the question of how visual this patch is. But these are really independent studies looking at different clusters. They are really looking for this result. So in an attempt to understand more comprehensively, more comprehensively how this patch of visual cortex is visually based for object knowledge, we did a more comprehensive study of actually categorizing exactly the functional fingerprint and the connectional fingerprint of each voxel in both blind and sighted. And so for, um, each, for both blind and sub sighted subjects, they performed fMRI experiments when they heard names of many, many different categories. So for each voxel, we can get the response profile, the functional fingerprints for both blind and sighted. And also we get the resting state connectivity pattern for each voxel in this uh, ventral visual cortex. And by comparing the blind and sighted, we got two maps. And this shows how similar blind and sighted are for the functional and connectivity fingerprints. So the more red indicates the blind and sighted are super, super similar. Like we really can't distinguish one from the other. The blue ones are the ones that they are very, very different. So it's not su sort of surprising that as you go more anterior, things become more abstract in a way. But there are many patches that we didn't know about. For instance, this is the post uh, lateral fusiform is more different between blind and sighted, and the medial anterior part is more similar. So it's not a, everything is visual or everything is more supermodel in a sense. And the same thing goes for the functional fingerprints. And of course, these two maps look quite similar. So it's if one region is affected by visual experience in terms of functional fingerprints, it's also affected by the connection fingerprints. So these two goes hand in hand, it goes along very well with the ideas the other speakers have talked about. So, we, so what are these regions? We classified, looked at three extremes. So the extremes that blind and sighted are super similar. Like this is really the cluster that you can't distinguish blind from sighted in both of the connect functional and connectional fingerprints. So this is a parahippocampal gyrus, and you really see whether the sighted look at pictures or blind listen to words. They are selective, more strongly activated by scenes and furnitures, these big things. Another cluster is more lateral, uh, occipital temporal cortex. Again, for both blind and sighted, they like things with bodily function, like tools, body parts. But um, if you look at the lateral fusiform area, that's usually the area hosts for faces or animals. When the sighted look at pictures, they really like these mammal. And so these are like faces, mammal, reptile, bird, fish, bug. But when the stimuli becomes worse to the blind sighted, it becomes, has no selectivity at all. And also if you look at the connection fingerprints, it's also quite different. And uh, so this, Distinction between medial and lateral fusiform has been recently noticed, uh, highlighted in a nature review neuroscience paper by Gross Spector, saying how these two patches actually differ by cell type, by connection, by function. And uh, our study added another dimension where they differ. It's like this area is very much shaped by whether the input is visual or not, but this area is not. And why so? We were puzzled for for quite a few years actually after we got those results. And we think it may really relate to what kind of things they process. It's for things selective to animals or physics. Like in evolution, there's not much we can do about them. Like we co-evolve with animals, we, we perceive them. But for artifacts, things are very different. It's like thing, artifacts happen because of people. We make the tools, we make the complex tools for our function. So the fact that something shapes like a flat is really, we make it flat so that we can sit on it, so that we can post things on it. We make it long so that we can hold it. So 
our intuition was um, proposed, post, put forward in a recent text paper we uh, wrote, is that these animacy differences not only capture how they look, but it really reflects how the evolutionary driven different ways of parsing we have with these objects. Like for artifacts, the shape indicate other aspects of the same object. But for animals, not so much so. And so our speculation is that for artifacts, the representation here is less visual because of this. So did we have explicit evidence for the artifact uh, representation here? So we did uh, explicit experiments just looking at the shape knowledge of sighted and blind. So for these common objects, the blind, although they can't see it, they can tell you very well what it feels like. It's a square, it's a round, it has a tail, blah, 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 from other modalities. And uh, so this is this uh, behavior reading. So this is independent reading of how similar two things are in shape by college students. And uh, this is reading by a control sighted uh, group of subjects. Again, the shape similar to matrix. And this is a rating for a group of congenitally blind. So the fact that the behavior rating is highly similar indicates that we don't need visual to drive the shame, same shape knowledge. The next question is, where is this shape knowledge for the blind and sighted? And uh, our results indicate that both of them are in IT. So we did representation similarity analysis for the neuronal responses in IT. And so this is the neural RDM, similarity matrix for sighted IT, and this is the neural pattern for blind IT, and both of them significantly correlated with the behavior rating of shape. And we did many control analysis, like making sure this is not semantic similarity, this is not tactile similarity. But it's really this, it feels like the shape representation here doesn't care whether you learn the knowledge from visual, from tactile, from verbal. So that's the uh, message for the first question we hope to address. Um, we think about, we talk about grounding information. It's like knowledge is grounded in sensory experience. But we hope to illustrate that it's not that simple. It's not that this, these are purely visual formats representations. But it's not that they are non-visual, like super abstract knowledge either. It di differed by domain. Like animals is more visual here. But artifacts is more supermodel because, maybe because our system knows that through evolution, certain shapes indicate other types of function. The second question we ask is really puzzled by how these distributed systems are bound together. So we saw many lines here. The lines are actually hypothetical. We assume that they have to be bounded. So they draw lines here, and uh, this is supposed to be a hub, so everything is linked here. But what's the reality, how things are linked together? And we actually didn't really have that much predictions about it. If you believe these are sensory motor, everything should be linked together. So this is the reality. This is a very good meta-analysis result that quite accepted for semantic processing that was done by Binder Adol 2009. They summarized all the studies that were good, comparing semantic uh, understanding to other non-semantic processing. And these are the activation peaks they got. And it's really a lot. And would you in interpret all these to be some kind of sensory motor representation? And how are they integrated? So that's the question we ask. Like, we don't know. Let's just look how the brain is connecting it. So we did quite a few very simple connectivity analysis, like what's a major white matter pathway. And I like this one because it really what I learned from neuroinformatics. So we just get all these nodes, the mask from Binderdor. So he shared their meta-analysis results mask with us. And um, we measured in healthy college students in the intrinsic uh, resting state connectivity, just at risk how these things are connected. And this is the connection we got, a lot and lot of connections, but it's not everything. And we did a simple modularity analysis. Just do they form some kind of community? And uh, surprisingly, it's very, very stable, three modules. 
we did a large sparsity rank, like ranking from very sparse to very fully connected, the results are super stable. We did many pre-processing different uh, techniques. We replicated the data on an independent subject group. And it's very stably uh, segregated into these three networks. What are they? We didn't really know. So just by eyeballing, it looks to be very, uh, three very familiar networks. So we already know about DMN, default mode, from the previous talk. And the frontal parietal control network is very, very similar to the left side. And this is a very classical language side. Okay. And also by doing this kind of modularity analysis, we were able to identify what nodes are important in linking these systems. And again, quite to our surprise, we got anterior temporal lobe, posterior MTG, angular gyrus, and, and MFG. And these are the regions throughout the literature from many different kinds of evidence have been said to be semantic hubs. And they are really from semantic dimension evidence, from fMRI evidence, from lesion evidence. But indeed, in this network community structure, they are the connector hubs. But there are different types of connector hubs. Like here, it's connecting these two networks. And the pink dot is connecting these two networks. So it's converging the, to the previous knowledge, but adding no, new information what they're connecting. So what are these three networks? So as I was explaining, so we went back to the literature to see what are these three networks just from the anatomical properties. And I, I was saying, so this is a very accepted high-level linguistic processing mask, a localizer from hundreds of subjects performing language versus non-language task. And uh, this is DMN, the default mode. But um, this is default mode. Uh, uh, Usually we think about default mode of uh, self-simulating, of thinking about the inner, internal self. But another aspect of the default mode in a different context is these are the regions that multi-modalities of information converge. So this is from a meta-analysis where they contracted people thinking about the audition, vision, tactile, and then they look at the overlap regions. And these are the default mode, the core regions. And uh, this is the semantic control from independent studies of showing high versus low semantic control contrast. And we think they align quite well with the networks we ident identify. So we, we tentatively <laughs> proposed that semantic processing is really the orchestration of these very three different three systems. And what are they? And the, to be very honest, we are very careful of the interpretation of the functions because we are really identifying from the brain patterns. But what kind of functions do they serve? And uh, so in combination with the cognitive theories of semantic processing, we guess that these are two formats of representing semantic knowledge. One is really through different kinds of experience. The other is really through symbolic processing. It's like how we learn so many knowledge through words, through language. And this is how it builds it. And of course, it needs a control system to act upon all these representations. Oops. <laughs> and uh, again, a tentative um, a preliminary results that um, before we think about semantic space, we think about how things look like, uh, the, the semantic features. We took another approach. So this is a language corpus-based distance matrix. So we get 360 um, words. And this is the, how closely related they are using things like word to vec. It's purely driven by language corpus co-occurrence using the kind of neural network model developed by Google. And we built this similarity space is how um, close, often they occur in the language context using statistical learning. And uh, we look at this um, language distance space and then we also got bold responses for each of the 360 words. And then we correlated neural pattern with, with this. And I want to highlight here, so these are the three modules, the, pa the neural pattern with the three modules. And it's really the, this green module, the response pattern of the green module correlates with the language space, but not the other modules. 
So I think it's indication that indeed it represents the Mento, but from the very language environment. And uh, just a final note of how when we look at structural connectivity, it's sort of converging on finding three modules as well. The, I want to skip this for the sake of time. So I started by, um, uh, so this is the summary of the second part of how things are connected. Do we re find connections reflecting these sensory motor experiences? But no, actually we were surprised by the three modules we found. And the, these three modules we think actually help us to understand how different formats of semantics can be found in the brain. So I started out by asking two big questions of the accepted view of semantic processing. And I want to conclude by saying that thinking about all semantics are just our experience with the world and combining it is not all. Firstly, the experience-based representation is more abstract and more complex than we think. It's affected by very much by the domains of knowledge we have. And also, I wish to bring language back to the semantic representation of humans. We learn so much knowledge, more knowledge with words. We learn about the meaning of a new word using the explanation from other words. So this, is kind, this kind of space is not captured by motor, sensory motor experiences. So this is something I'm proposing, I'm starting to think about. Of course, there are many new questions to be answered if we think about semantic representation this way, but that's other future work to be done. So I want to thank uh, my lab at BNU, Beijing Normal University. It's a very nice institute, and uh, I welcome you guys to visit. And my collaborators, Afsan Karmaza, Harvard, Maris Pilon, at Chimac, these are collaborators for my blind studies and my local collaborators who helped me with the network analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for Anne Yes. Um, the word to that um, analysis. So I think you're arguing that's a symbolic, that gives me symbolic networks, all right? That the, um, in the Google world, they think of that essentially referring to, symbolic, to semantic content. They're, divide, they're defining these word vectors as being in semantic words. So why do you think that then didn't then, then uh, uh, um, also address your semantic network? It really depends on how we define semantics. So, uh, so if we think about the brain semantic network, this whole thing is the brain semantic network. So it's part of the brain semantic network. It's just a different format. So your front end, your your um, new one, I guess. So your three networks, right? right. So one's, one, you think one's more experiential, one's more symbolic, right. one's more, yes. and the other one? Uh, it's control, it's a control yeah. mechanism, yes. Yeah, so it's just more. Yeah, if just thinking on that. What is, so how do you see, so if you go back to, there is a, a diagram of the three networks, of the triangle. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the control network would be the blue one. So why, I mean, why would that? So would you envisage this network somehow to control the 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 function of the other networks, or would you see that as um, just a way of linking them? Or so, what is the role of these um, hubs that you have there in between these networks, and what is the role that the networks themselves play? Okay, yeah, that's definitely, to be honest, I don't know. But I think that's why I think this way of thinking of this network really raises many new questions that we didn't think about before. Because before we think about these regions, we study them individually. We, we put a tag them, okay, this is more visual because it's close to MT. This is more audition because it's close to STG. But um, this, the fact that these become, be, belongs to the same community, they perform, they are linked together for some function. But then, do they, what's their role in this big community? And uh, the hubs, are they just transferring information? Are they more important for both? I really don't know, but we didn't ask those questions because we didn't know the structure. So this, uh, to answer your first question, what the, what's this control thing? 
you know, so we sort of need control for all cognitive processing tasks. But uh, these regions are really found to be more strongly activated by semantic control relative to other things that are matched on task difficulty if you're matching them on RT. And we think both of them are very complex <laughs> representations. Like these, uh, we have experience information for like things like cell phone, how we touch it, how we use it, how, what it lo looks like. To answer them in the appropriate context, we definitely need to, to control. So I don't have a better explanation than that. So were you surprised that the, along the long axis of the superior temporal surface, you have this whole stream going down from uh, from Heschel's to anterior temporal lobe? You would have thought that they would subserve different functions and form different modules, particularly given the role of the anterior temporal lobe as an you know integrative right. uh, hub for semantic processing. Right. And so in the context of semantic dementia. Right. So we, our results actually highlight anterior temporal load very well. So uh, although this one becomes the brain because in modularity analysis you have to assign it to some module, but actually it's really a strong connector, these two, for these two types of symbolic and experiential um, representation of semantics. So it's these two numbers, the red and the green unbind here. So it goes actually very well with the semantic dimension evidence that if you damage here, you lose the contact for both verbal and nonverbal semantic tasks. So that's our interpretation. Now I think it offers actually the, the direct evidence for uh, NTL to be one of the hubs. Yeah. So could you just repeat, I missed it, uh, how you selected those nodes to explore the network of which you explored the connectivity? So, so those, okay. I think, 100, but is it exactly the same coordinates of the studies in the review? Right. We, we uh, asked this mo the results from Binder et al. just took their meta-analysis results, the peak voxels, then we built a sphere around those peak voxels. And, and there are nothing, for example, in primary motor cortex or premotor or anything in the visual around the peak cortex? <laughs> it's true, I'm confident because actually Binder wrote a text paper in 2011 commenting how this semantic understanding does not have very modality specific activations. So he would, it, it's a big discussion about it. But the task that was driven by uh, these meta analysis is listening to understanding language. So I think the peripheral aspect of object processing is partialed out because maybe you don't need those to understand language. Uh, if you show the, the actual picture from the previous slide, aren't there some nodes uh, around those? Yeah, there are, but these are the raw data of all the studies, and uh, these are the meta-analysis that uh, the activation likelihood is above the threshold. So the ones that tend to be more consistently, consistently activated across studies.